Hello, it's Andrew Eborn here. Welcome to another edition of Andrew Eborn's Lives on Lockdown. Today, my guest is a close up magician, entertainer, and lecturer. Delighted to welcome Paul Gordon. Welcome back after the break. It's Andrew Eborn here. I'm delighted that my special guest is none other than Paul Gordon. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? I'm very good, apart from this. Oh, no, what happened? I went right flat on my face yesterday. <coughs> I was um, going out for a walk, tripped on the curb. I did that. I've got a similar all down this arm, on my backside, on my hip, on my knee and my hands. So which part of Be Alert didn't you understand? <laughs> well, as I say, Be Alert, the country needs more alerts. <laughs> it's, always, it's always a joy, isn't it? But, but generally, how are you coping in lockdown? I'm actually enjoying it, you know. I'm, I'm enjoying the... Uh, uh, the peace and quiet. I'm enjoying the uh, creativity side because I've been really busy on that score. <coughs> um, I actually, I, I'm, I'm coping well because I, you know, I, as I've told you before, I, I suffer from anxieties and depression and things. The actual fact, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm bring it on. Well, it is one of the extraordinary things is that um, you're a magician, you're also a lecturer, you're a writer, uh, and some other talents which we'll come on to in a bit. But at the moment, so many members of the Magic Circle, we're both members of the Magic Circle, are spending lots of time in front of a video screen reinventing themselves. What do you make of all of that? Well, I think it's good if you're good at it. Uh, I think a lot of the problem, well, not a problem, I don't want to be knocking anything or anybody, but a lot of people don't know how to perform for a camera uh, and they end up staring at the camera and uh, I see a lot of magicians performing things and you can see them trying to look at what they're doing whilst they're doing it. Uh, it looks really bad and I mean I know this background here is not great but it's better than um, the, the, the linen cupboard isn't it? I know you're absolutely right. Well, what I find extraordinary, and we've done a lot of these sort of things, and also been involved in some, some of the major ones around the world with online stuff, is that everybody gets to admire people's bookcases. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's, I, it's either the bookcases or they show off all their awards. Most of the books people have never read. <laughs> oh, I was, I was just talking about that. I, I've just done a, a video for magicians touring my magic bookcases uh, just to for fun you know talking about old books and why I like them and why I'd recommend them or why I wouldn't recommend them and um, so that was good fun but also this is not a plug by the way but this is um, some of the stock of my books here. Oh it's uh, selling well Paul. They, they are yes um, so this is a lot of magic here and um, a few few months ago before lockdown we had a, a plumber come round and he said can I ask a question he said why have you got so many copies of the same book? So I, I said to him, I love it so much, I bought a hundred copies of each. Oh, fantastic. And being the master salesman, did you manage to sell him one? Unfortunately not, no. <laughs> a bit of a shame. <coughs> As you say, a lot, of, a lot of entertainers generally are having to work in this new extraordinary way. Um, Paul Gordon's top tips as to how to handle it, because a lot of people do get it wrong. Well, they do get it wrong. I mean, the, 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 the handling, of, well... I, I think uh, the best thing you can do for, for, for lockdown is to make the, the most of it. And, uh, you know, you can look at it and think this is dreadful, this is bad. Of course it's bad. People are dying and it's a, it's a dreadful, dreadful thing. However, it's an opportunity to, to do non-magic things like odd jobs around the house, um, tidying, cleaning, fixing the panel that you didn't do, sorting the car out, etc., etc. But magic-wise, it's a wonderful time for rereading the old books that you've, you've forgotten about. Maybe if you're creative, uh, create some stuff, practice some magic you should be practicing, um, learn how to do moves much better than you thought you were doing them, um, interact with family, go, go on Zoom and talk to your aunts and uncles that uh, you, know, you haven't spoken to in years. There are so many things. In fact, when we come out of lockdown, I'll be a bit, little bit disappointed because in lockdown, I found that the people I do see when I go for a walk, they're being much more friendly, the air smells cleaner. I can see the stars at night. Uh, I feel healthier. Um, yeah, I can't. I, I'm failing to see, apart from the uh, the deaths and so on. I can't. I can't see any negatives. 
Yeah, I, I, it is extraordinary. I think I, I often say this: there's nothing that unites people more than a common enemy. Absolutely. I mean, as you well know, in the World War Two, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Always good. Now, listen. I I really look at your website, as I'm sure zillions of people have, and I love this quote, which sort of starts here. It says, "Paul Gordon is a modern master of close-up magic." His extensive knowledge and ability to create visual and stunning routines is unmatched in the world. He's also one of the best teachers I've seen with cards. And that's from Jeff McBride. How much I did know. you pay him? I pay, do you know what? It cost a lot of money to get that quote, I'll tell you that. Um, seriously though, when he sent that quote um, only a few months back, I was absolutely stunned by it because uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a biggie, isn't he? He's a big uh, Las Vegas entertainer and a fantastic, absolutely fantastic magician. And uh, I think it slightly came about because some years ago, I, I, I bumped into Eugene Berger at a, a convention. And I think we all have assumptions about various magicians. And I think he probably had an assumption about what I was like. But anyway, I was entertaining in the bar for fun at uh, one of the hotels. And... He came over and said, you know, I, he, I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was really wonderful to see. And I'm not patting my own back on this. It's just what he said. And so that was appreciated. And then he said, um, I must show my friend Jeff some of your videos. And I think it must have come from that, I guess. Uh, and since then, I've created some magic that Jeff now uses. Oh, no, fa fascinating stuff. And you are within the magic world. Um, a legend, if you like. You're a prolific author. You, you lecture superbly. You've been to the Magic Circle several times uh, and also a regular performer. How has your life changed from performance wise? Because obviously a lot of people's income has dried up uh, during these unprecedented times. What are you doing? Are, are you managing to earn a living at the moment? Well, I'll probably tell you something now which may surprise you and may surprise your watchers and listeners that. Um, uh, and I'll get to the answer, but it, just to backtrack on it a little bit. I remember watching, uh, it was on the Terry Wogan show uh, in 1987, and he was interviewing Ronnie Barker. And Ronnie Barker, on that interview, was the same age I am now, which is nearly 60. And Ronnie Barker said to uh, Terry Wogan, I'm quitting, I'm stopping, this is it. I'm telling you now for the first time, I'm telling the people watching, I've done my bit. And I remember that resonated with me because he, did, he didn't want to really kind of become an older performer. And Andrew, you and I have both seen them at conventions where you think, oh, I wish they'd have stopped years ago because they're embarrassing themselves or they're just not quite as sharp as they used to be. So in lockdown, I've been thinking about this and I love lecturing. I think, you know, I, I, I'm a good teacher, I love lecturing, I'm enthusiastic with it. I love doing the conventions. Uh, I love doing all that sort of stuff, but I've decided I'm now no longer going to do gigs. Uh, if a gig comes up and it's handy and it's something I really want to do, I probably would consider it. But I, you know, I've been doing gigs for such a long time and nothing has to last forever. And I think it's lockdown that has made me realize I mean, thankfully, financially, I don't have to do anything anyway because I work very hard over the years. But, you know, I don't want to do gigs anymore. So that's it. And, and is that because you've lost the enthusiasm for it? Or do you think you're not as good as you used to be? Well, I think we, well, um, schlepping around the countryside on the motorways isn't as fun as it used to be. And it never was fun. Uh, so entertaining drunks at parties and weddings and so on you know I, I, I was pretty good at it but um i think the older you get you lose your nerve a little bit uh, and you certainly lose your desire for it but like i said i think we all have a shelf life in certain areas of what we do um and i think you know i don't want to mention any names but there were some big names you and i will both know back in the 70s and 80s who they really were past their sell by date but they didn't see into the next stage of teaching or writing, which is what they should have done. You know, maybe they should have done a divernon and started becoming gurus um, and that kind of thing. And I, I'd, I'd hate it for people to see me entertaining one day and, they, and saying something, oh, he's not as good as he used to be. 
Well, I mean, it's sound advice. And is that advice you give to other performers uh, who are watching this at the moment? Well, I've actually been giving that advice for years. And I, um, one bit of advice I've given since I was a, a young lad at lectures <coughs> is this. I said, you know, whatever your racket is, always try and find a few more strings to that particular bow. Uh, so in magic for me, I thought years ago, if I can do magic, I can do gigs, I can do lectures, I could do conventions, I can do writing, I can do creating, and I can do personal tuition. And if one of those strings breaks, there's another one, another one there. And then of course there's the singing as well, but that's something else. So, I, and I said to magicians, my best advice would be, is to earn as much money as you can, whilst you can, pay your mortgage off, get some savings, but whatever you do, is one day you may need a year's worth of savings because you might break your arm, you might have some issue. And here we are with coronavirus, and I bet a lot of those magicians are now wishing they'd have heeded that advice I said. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely, and as you know, I deal with all sorts of people in the entertainment world and the sporting world and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And they all, yeah. are, they have their normal sort of pattern. They have climbed to the top, they get that sparkling moment when they forget all the sound advice they've been given by people like you and others. And they get all this wealth all of a sudden, they spend it all and suddenly it disappears. And when it disappears and all the friends and supposed friends that they had disappear with it, all of a sudden yeah. they're left devoid of not only money, but friends and everything else. And it becomes very tricky, doesn't it? It does. And I can tell you, I've got a, I've got a, um, a personal connection to that comment you just made, Andrew, because um, the first thing is, you know, when you read in the newspaper that somebody, a famous act from the 70s or 80s, is now destitute, I often say, well, it's their own fault. I don't mean that harshly, but, you know, often it is their own fault because they, as you said, they go and buy the Lamborghini, they go and buy the big mansion, but they don't have any readies, they don't have any proper cash, do they? And so it all dies out, and so do their friends. Now, my, my father, um, his family business uh, was a very big business and they were very, very wealthy. Uh, they didn't pass any of it on, by the way, but they were a very wealthy family. Well, what was and, the line of business? Um, well, have you, you know, Demek Sherry? Oh, yes, of course. Demek Sherry that was, not, it's now allied Demek. Uh, my, my father was the, uh, their, their business was called Lewis Gordon and Sons, which were the importers for Demek. Uh, so they were multi, multi, multi-millionaires, the whole family, you know, lots of money. So my parents, when I was a boy, they used to have regular parties with every celebrity you can think of, all these famous people. And the catering was done by Harrods and Harrods used to come down on the horse and cart. This is true. In those days, they used to bring down all the catering, they used to do the catering, cost them a fortune. And my grandma said to my mum once, invite the same people for afternoon coffee and see how many turn up. <laughs> and did, did he follow that advice? They didn't. And when the money went, which it did go, when the money blew, uh, that was it. Nobody came. And, and it is very sad. And I do, I see that more and more and more. Um, and I think it's, it's really, really hard. I mean, and one of the things that you deal with and, and you're a great advocate for is, is about mental health. Yeah. I mean, I, um, excuse the cough, by the way, it's just a tickle. <clears throat> um, well, the mental health issues, uh, I had a strange upbringing. Um, I, I don't want to bore everybody with this sort of negativity thing, but I, I went to a boarding school. But which and, one did you go to? Uh, I went to Moden, which is in Hove, which is a prep school for boys from seven until 12 or whatever it is and uh, so I was sent to this boarding school and it never dawned on me then but of course it's total abandonment I mean I you know I didn't know I was going to be staying over so I literally went there when I was seven and five years later I went home and it was a big thing and then because my parents had then lost their money they then sent me to um, a comprehensive school now the comprehensive school, if you can imagine going from a 45 children in a boarding school in this very old fashioned, it's a mixture as you probably know of um, Tom Brown school days, 
the Browning version, Goodbye Mr. Chips. It was just like that. And then going to one and a half thousand lads in a comprehensive school. So I went from talking like this when I was seven years old right. to suddenly when I was 12 years old, it was, oi, oi, and all that, you know. So with all this and other stuff, I got divorced and so on. I then ended up with a breakdown. And uh, I've not been the same since. <laughs> But, but, but I think I think what's important, and that you laugh about it, but I know there's a, a really serious element behind all this, because it's only fairly recently that people, in a way, have been given permission, if you like, to talk about these things. If if you break your leg or you fall down on the pavement, <laughs> as you've done and demonstrated beautifully, people will talk about it, and they'll listen. They say you broke your leg, okay, this is how you get it fixed. Mental yeah. health, people have been embarrassed about, haven't they? Well, people just don't get it. I mean, I you know, I've have I've got family who don't understand it they think you look fine you look good you look happy or chirpy or smiley but they don't really see what's going on up here and I think they think that if you suffer from anxiety and depression saying things like oh cheer up there are people worse off is going to help it doesn't help it makes things worse uh, it's nothing to do with being happy I mean I'm happy I'm very happy I've got a lovely home beautiful garden, a gorgeous wife, a nice lifestyle, and I love what I do. But I still suffer from anxiety and depression. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a really hard thing. And it's happens to so many people in show business, in entertainment. And I think we become entertainers sometimes because of it. So when I was a small boy, it was my cure for, um, well, I, I wasn't really bullied, but it's my cure for I, I, I didn't like school. I wasn't academic, so I used to muck about at school to get laughs and smiles. So I used to tell jokes and do some magic, and um, obviously that then carries on. But it's only, as you say, in the last 15, 10, 15 years that people have actually decided to be open about it, which is why I am on the Magic Circle website, uh, the Facebook um, Magic Circle group. And I'm still surprised that Every now and then I get personal messages from people saying, oh, don't keep going on about it. Nobody cares. Well, people do care and it's a serious issue. And as you and I both know, we've lost a lot of magicians in the last few years to suicide. Yeah, and, and, and every death is obviously tragic. And, and so often you do find in this profession, it's, uh, it's actually with um, comedians, with lots of performers and so on and so forth. Those are in the public eye actually are, are tormented by these demons. It's what I call the joke cloak, if you like. It's everybody's yeah. living a lie because you're out there performing, you've got all this adulation. You then go back to your home where actually it's just you and it's really, really rather depressing. Well, I, I'm not just sure this is depressing, but there's a, such a big come down from this high of entertainment and adulation. And I think the best way to cope with it is, is to say to yourself, I am aware that this is just tonight's applause. You know, don't take it to, to heart that everybody loves you and everybody wants you. Because um, there's a mutual friend of ours who's now, he's now out of the business. Um, and I remember seeing him at Chroma and he was performing at Chroma. He asked me to go up and see him do a, a show up there. And when I did, he said, I love it. He said, the audiences love me, the cast, that everybody loves me and it's so great and it's so good and uh, everybody gets on. These are my best friends. I said, they're not your best friends. These are people that you're going to see for two weeks of your life. And when it's over, it's going to be great. You'll go home to your normal life and the, the lawn will still need mowing. The washing up still needs to be done. So just remember that we're just giving people some entertainment for a little, little vignette of time. And then it's on to the next thing. If you become too in in uh, in awe of yourself, that's when it starts affecting you. Oh, no, absolutely. And we always say, look, never believe your own PR. Oh, absolutely. I mean, people who do. I mean, I, uh, I'm a firm firm believer of keeping your head on straight. And Richard Young interviewed me uh, for his podcast um, some years ago, and it was nice of him to say that of all the people he'd interviewed, he thought I was the most level headed and the most kind of normal. Well, I kind of have worked at that very hardly, hard because I am normal. We are all normal, but whatever job that we do, you do the best you can in that job, don't you? 
Yeah, and I think the reality of people are onions, if you like. There are many, many layers to them. And most of the people, they don't let you see beneath or they don't open up the kimono and see the real person. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, when I go to the magic circle, I, I try to be me. Uh, that is, now the real me is pretty quiet. I mean, I'm not an extrovert. I may appear it, but the real me is in my log cabin, which I've got down the end of the garden, with a glass of wine and a good book and peace and quiet. Now, when I go to the magic circle, um, it is just full of people trying to impress other people who are trying to impress. And the tr trouble with that is um, you end up with this sort of buzzing of egos and untruths and shows. Whereas if you could walk into, say, the magic circle club room and say, OK, everybody, stop the bullshit. Let's just be normal. We're not impressing anybody. Let's just be ourselves. I think the fraternity would cope better and the magic fraternity would be a better place for it. No, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, Paul. And what happens, I mean, social media is a lot to blame for this as well, because social media gives an artificial impression of other people's lives, doesn't it? And so people yeah. only seem to post the good stuff. We are, here are the wonderful people I'm meeting. Here's the fantastic gigs. I've been paid more than I've ever been paid before. And my life is so much better than yours. Like me now, share, share, share. And if you don't like, well, blah, off you go. And it's, it's so false, isn't it? It is false, and I think it's part of this, um, uh, you know, I don't want to sound like an old fart, but um, it's part of this narcissistic way uh, of life these days where it's all about selfies, isn't it? Uh, selfies and people want praise all the time. And in schools, they've taken out losers, haven't they, I believe? It's now everybody's a winner. Um, but the truth is, people aren't all winners. Life is hard. And, the, and I think I've seen some younger people suddenly have this huge shock where they go out into the big wide world and things are bad. You know, people are dying. We all get illnesses. Things don't work out the way they want it to. But because, you know, um, social media and uh, sitcoms and everything else make it all about the narcissistic me, we, me rather, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite ugly, isn't it? Oh, it, it's certainly ugly. And I think um, that, that's the good word for it, because everything is so artificial. Everything is a moment in time. And I, I often say that the more technology has evolved to give us means to communicate, the less we're actually able to communicate. And by that, if you go to see people in restaurants, eventually when we get out of lockdown, so many people are all stuck on their mobile phones, blocking away. They, they've got their heads buried. And some of the saddest scenes that I, I've seen are when you go to these glorious places around the world, you go to Venice, and people are on the gondola, and all they're doing is looking at Google or whatever, rather than just enjoying the moment. I mean, I, absolutely. I, I, I hate it. You know, when, when, when I was a kid, you took a photograph of the Sphinx. You took a photograph of that. You didn't take a photograph of yourself in front of the Sphinx, did you? So every photograph you see on Facebook has this pouty figure in front of it with the beautiful thing behind it and i think it's it's extraordinary that people are so obsessed with 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 uh this kind of artificial artificial uh, way of life and it but as soon as you knock it or as soon as you say something about it people think you're 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 becoming like an old man you know grumbling about it um and it just reminds can i just say something else on this um, <laughs> There was a, a, just on the magic fraternity, and I don't know if this is apropos, but uh, um, every now and then on the magic uh, circle website, somebody will say, oh, Paul Gordon blocked me or something like that. Now, there's a reason for this is because in the old days, if you went into the pub and there was some drunk ass in the corner getting on your nerves, you wouldn't go up and engage conversation, would you? I mean, you would avoid that person. But for some reason, on Facebook or on media, if you decide you don't like that person and their company because they are bringing you down or they're negative or they're racist or rude or whatever it may be, um, if you block them, they take it as some sort of kind of dreadful insult. Well, it's not an insult. It's just that if you were in the pub, you wouldn't speak to them. So why do you have to engage with them on social media? Well, I, I think the honest answer is people take it so you're, you're absolutely right. But people, we, we've been built up now to say that our lives have to be surrounded by light. It is in 
incredibly artificial. I know Facebook set the limit of 5,000 friends if it's a personal uh, page. I, for whatever reason, have 5,000 people who are on my Facebook page. Do I know most of them? No, probably, absolutely not. And, it's, and, and they probably don't know me either. So, but the reality, it's all about numbers. It's not about proper interaction. And we're obsessed. We're obsessed now with celebrity. And the whole thing is that it never used to be a job before. Nowadays, you ask children in school, what do they want to be? They want to be celebrities. What yeah. does that mean? Well, I don't, I mean, I, you know, I mean, if, in a strange way, in this small, uh, I call it, I always call it a racket because I think a business sounds a bit pompous. In this racket of ours, the magic business, I suppose in a very small way, um, I'm, I'm kind of well known in it, but it, 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 means, it means absolutely nothing to me, that, that sort of so-called status thing, because I like people and if I like people I like, I really like people. Now that sounds obvious. So uh, when I, when I, at magic conventions, I meet loads of wonderful people that, you know, uh, these aren't famous people. These are people who are just hobbyists. But often I, I strike up much better relationships with those people than the people who think they are the be all and end all. And when I go to London, um, when I used to go to London uh, I, I, on the tube, I, I'm one of these people, you don't see them anymore. My dad was like it. I sit on the tube saying hello to people. And sometimes they look at you as if you're, you know, what I do, I just say, good morning, dear boy. How are you? What a lovely day. What are you reading there? That's nice. You know, and you know, why not? We're all going to die at some stage. So I might as well make the most of it. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. And I think it's going to get, I mean, I do a similar sort of thing as you know, and, uh, it's going to get worse, though, when we come out of this lockdown because of social distancing. And mm. the thing that spreads most is fear. Yeah. When people are afraid, they, they say it's the most, it was Barnard in, in PR, remember the old Dixie Cup, so that's how they used to do it. The biggest selling tool of all is fear. If people yeah. think gonna, that you're going to run out of stuff, you run and get your toilet paper. So we run out of that, it's unnecessarily. So you, you get your disinfectant, you, you get scared of people. And if yeah. there's that fear, What's going to happen is people will get scared about getting close to people. It's going to be an extraordinary time coming out, isn't it? Well, I think it, I mean, I think it is, but maybe it's an opportunity for the human race to start doffing their cap at strangers when they walk down the road. Because um, I've actually noticed that people are being more friendlier, but it's gen generally, uh, generally uh, people... Uh, older people, I'll put it that way. Uh, and I, I just wish that uh, younger people wouldn't walk down the street with their heads down all the time. It's this, um, I joke with my wife about this, and I noticed like uh, lots of girls, they walk with their arms folded with this kind of, they, they look absolutely horrified that anybody might smile at them as if they've been told somewhere along the line that if some man smiles at you, he's after you or something, and, and they walk with this really kind of glare, at the, 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 like a, an invisible spot on the pavement they're sort of staring at, out of total fear. I'm hoping that maybe they'll embrace another way, but I don't know, uh, maybe they won't. Um, well, I think you're right. I mean, society has sort of readjusted. You know? I mean, the, the other thing that, that happens when I say uh, nothing unites people like a common enemy, the other thing that happens is that everybody becomes an expert. And the people who were constitutional experts all those weeks ago, Brexit, remember that? <laughs> when they were all constitutional experts, everybody, but everybody's become a virologist. <laughs> <coughs> Haven't they just? I, I just think, I, I, I think po uh, possibly that uh, this keyboard warrior type uh, attitude that you're, you can be, uh, so brave when you're here. I first noticed this, by the way, about 20 years ago. This is a lovely, funny story for, for, for the folks listening. Well, I think it is anyway. This is the first time I noticed this. About 20 years ago, maybe longer, there was a, on um, Outlook Express, there used to be these alt.magic groups. Do you remember those? I do, I do. Yeah, and it was some weird little thing. You could sort of send little messages back and forth. Anyway, there was this one character who seemed to be the font of all knowledge. Anything to do with magic, he had an opinion on. Um, anybody's opinion always differed from his and vice versa. 
and he sounded absolutely fantastic. I thought I'd like to meet him. He sounds wonderful. Anyway, I did meet him. I met him at a convention about a year later up in Scotland. I was lecturing in Edinburgh and he was there. Somebody pointed him out. He was about 11 years old. <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, you know, and that was the first time I thought to myself, oh, there's something going on here with this internet malarkey. It's not quite all it seems. And, and what was his name? Oh, I, I, I have no idea. I can't remember. But, but, but it is extraordinary because everybody now, and even with an 11 year old, you can have some uh, amazing knowledge and things like that uh, on that sort of basis. But let me take you back, Paul, and you mentioned about the extraordinary upbringing you had um, mm. with your parents. They were lots and lots of money. Um, what is your first memory? Uh, my first, well, I, I was born in the early 60s and I can remember being in a pram. Um, <clears throat> I think it's why I have this kind of joie de vivre. You know, I, I really do. I'm like you. I mean, you're, you're so ebullient. It's wonderful. I think so many people could, if you, if you could bottle your ebullience and sell it, Andrew, I think you'd make a fortune. Yeah, I'll get you to sell it because you're the best salesperson. I always say that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go into business, you and I. Love um, it. <laughs> uh, but I can remember, I can remember being in a pram. I can remember watching the trees and I can remember looking at things, this, that and the other. And I can remember the first magic trick I saw which was my great uncle. And do you remember the days of um, uh, turn up trousers? Of course, I still uh, wear them. <laughs> yes, uh, well, your generation would, Andrew. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> my my, gra my uh, great uncle had turn up trousers, which was something in the, if, if people don't know, it was like a, a leftover uh, fashion thing from the war. And he would make a coin vanish and I later found out it was an old Nate Leipzig move where he'd, he'd drop the coin onto his thigh and it would, it would swivel its way down into the turn up. So uh, that's the first magic thing I ever remember. And, and um, do, you, do you remember though that, that moment, this is what people always forget, that moment of wonder when yeah. the coin disappeared. And I, I've written about this in my books all the time and I say, the reason I'm so enthusiastic is when I perform and when I lecture is because I can still remember that moment why I got into magic. It was my uncle Reg, it was that pivotal moment and I still remember that when I perform. So I try and enthuse pe other people when I perform to, to, to retain that thought because as soon as you start forgetting those lovely moments you might as well give up because as Frank Sinatra, another hero of mine would say, if you are indifferent, it's all over. You know, why should people watch you if you have no enthusiasm for what you do? I know, I'm absolutely right. And I think so, so many magicians, and you go to far more magic conventions and things on, that, that I do, but they are so obsessed with buying the next new trick as opposed to really focusing on connecting. And, and I love the magicians madly. They're fantastic and lots of performance and so on and so forth. But actually, if we spent more time just perfecting the art of performance, we'd be much better as performers, wouldn't we? Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's great. They buy, as long as they buy my tricks. I'm happy. <laughs> um, but uh, in all seriousness, yeah, I mean, you know, my dad gave me some sterling advice when I was an early teenager. He said, stop fiddling around with all these tricks in the bedroom, go down and perform them in the pub. Now, my father was a salesman, so, you know, that's, that was his racket. Wait, he was, from. Yeah, and he was a very good salesman. He could sell, I don't know, he could sell snow to the Eskimos, uh, whatever the phrase is, and he was very good. Coles to uh, Newcastle. Beg pardon? Coles to Newcastle. Coles to Newcastle, that's right, Coles to Newcastle. Um, and he... he he said to me, go down to the local pub. I'll take you down. I was about 11, 12 years old. And he said, go and entertain the people. And I was shaking like a leaf. I really was. And it's, it's at that stage that you, you know that adrenaline is actually brown. Um, <laughs> I thank you. Uh, and I went down there to the pub and I was awful. I was dreadful. And I, I, I cried. I went home and my dad said, you'll go back down again tomorrow. And I went down. Anyway, cut a long story short, eventually I started getting the knack of it. And that's where I learned how to entertain is by actually doing it and getting out there. 
And, that, and that's that's the problem, I think, with a lot of variety, traditional varieties. As you know, I'm vice chair of the Equity TVB, the variety branch, uh, and it's the biggest branch within equity. And talking to the older folks, they always used to say they trod the boards, they spent many, many hours on stage being bad. Yeah. Nowadays, with the closure of many clubs, there's no place for people to be bad. No, there isn't. I mean, uh, and the trouble is, these days, people are bad. And they seem to be quite happy to be bad. And the people that book them don't seem to be unhappy that they are bad. You know, back in the day, if you were bad, you were off. I mean, that was it. Um, and I can remember um, uh, another little story for you. I, do, 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 did you know that back in the day, I used to work in entertainments on the other side? Did, I, did you know that? On the other side? As in Doris Stokes or? As in Dor <laughs> no, I used to work in theatre management. Right. So yes, I, did, I, I did know that, yes. Yes, yeah, so, but when I left school, I went straight into, I was 15 years old, and I went to the local theatre, and I kind of said like they did in the voice and the black stuff, I said, give us a job, and I got a job. And um, so that's, I started in that. And in that, I met all the celebrities, I met everybody, because we booked them all, everybody you can name. And one of them was... Who Bernard did you meet? Give us some names. Oh, uh, Victor Borgo, Bernard Manning, um, who was great. Ken Dodd, Des Connor, Bruce Forsyth, I mean, Arthur Askey, I'm going back a long time with some of these names, uh, Jazz Axe, um, Ball, Bar Barbara and Bilk, and uh, comedians, I mean, just everybody, you know, you name anybody that was around in the late 70s to late 80s, I, I just met them all. And Bernard Manning uh, was the friendliest of all of them. Now, I know people have all these issues with his act, but, you know, you separate the man from the act, I always think, or the person from the act. And he was lovely. And he, he, I told him I was a magician. I did some magic for him. And he said to me, do you want to come and work at the embassy? Ah! I did. I went up there, I went up to Manchester, and I did um, two, two or three, I can't remember, I think it was at least two... Um, times I went there and I entertained and it, and I was only in my 20s then but I, I was good I did well but I learned so much you know I, I learned that's why that's why I've got this very naughty sense of humor and I've created lots of adult tricks over the years <laughs> but, but I, think, I think that's right and it's working to that sort of audience because growing up at that stage and you mentioned Bernard Manning and he uh, uh, was he's a divisive character because people look back and they mm. think about the 70s and there was the racist and the sexist and all that sort of stuff. And people, in, in a way, it's gone completely the other way where you've taken out that sort of sense of humour. And I think, in a way, you're absolutely right. There are some appalling things happening. There always have been in the world. But they yeah. always say that uh, in humour, you have to know where the line is and go beyond it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, 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 you know, for, for bearing in mind that my parents were very kind of old-fashioned and... Uh, you know, my mum was a, 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 an old, uh, hang on a second. Oh, I love Wait. it. That's for me. That's another book sale. Uh, hey, it's, it. somebody, it's somebody trying to book you for a kid's party and they're so disappointed you said you're not going to do it. <laughs> um, oh, I lost my train of thought there. Oh, yeah, my mum. Yeah. Uh, my mum was a very old-fashioned, penny-type woman, Christian-type woman. But she, she hated censorship. She used to say, if you don't like what's on TV, there's an off switch. If you don't like the magazines on the top shelf, don't look at them. It's as simple as that. And that was, and I learned that a lot from her, there were lots of things from her. And I always say that if you, um, if you censor comedy, you don't have comedy, do you? I mean, you have a, you know, I, and I know this is not a, a, an age thing, but uh, like you, you know, back in the seventies, I used to watch the comedians on TV and all the comedians around in those days that made me laugh, these days would be classed as being uh, old fashioned, probably. Uh, Jim Davidson, Freddie Starr, um, Bob Monkhouse live, who was very, very blue live, Jimmy James, and the rest of them. Now, when I watch, well, I don't, but sometimes I turn on the TV and they have these modern comedians from um, the O2. I can't find the gags. I just cannot see what the joke is. But the audience laugh, and I have a slight suspicion it's a little bit like the Emperor's New Clothes. 
you know? Uh, an interesting thought. And well, what's happened now is comedians have become the new <coughs> pop stars and they are packing out what were venues traditionally for major, major acts. And I can tell you as a promoter, you know, I promote as well. As a mm. promoter, it's much cheaper to put a guy or a girl on with a mic than it is to have all these fantastic special effects. And yeah. so from that point of view, um, and they are hilarious, it's more about situational comedy. It's about describing, because lives are funny, people are funny. And people mm. who can describe those experiences and say, look, let's not take ourselves too seriously. They do really well and touch a, touch a, a, a nerve, if you like, with people. Yeah, well, they, I'm, I'm sure they do, uh, but you know, it, it's a, obviously comedy is so uh, um, individual, isn't it? Uh, for my part, I like the, I, I'm a Don Rickles fan. I love Don Rickles. Uh, I, I love um, uh, Billy Connolly and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I don't like insipid humour that you feel like it's been taped, uh, watered down a little bit. Uh, and so sometimes I find modern comedians just not, just not very funny. You know, I like a good gag. Um, but, 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 but also on that though, Paul, if other people find them funny, does it really matter that you don't? Not, not at all, no. I mean, uh, absolutely. Uh, having said that, um, my stepdaughter, she went to see... Um, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten his name now. Is it Yo2 uh, a while back? And I asked... Uh, Michael McIntyre? Michael McIntyre. There you go. Look at your mind. Actually, be a mind reader. That's in my book McIntyre. coming out tomorrow. That's the one. <laughs> and I actually asked her to to ask a couple of people what they found funny, and I kid you not, she asked the person next door to her, who was laughing nonstop. And he said, I, "To be quite frank, I don't know why I'm laughing, but I'm laughing because everybody else is." But and laughter is contagious, isn't it? That's it. So, um, but you know, I. Um, uh, Oh, but to, to a little vignette for you. I've got a wonderful Don Rickles, Frank Sinatra story. Can I tell it if I tell it with the language or not? Oh, absolutely. Okay. This story has been watered down, but this is the exact way it happened. Uh, it's been written about, but it's always been written about incorrectly. And I'm a, I'm a Sinatra aficionado, so I know more about Frank Sinatra than anybody. True. <coughs> anyway. Frank Sinatra told this story himself, so he was laughing about himself. Uh, he said that um, back in the 50s, huge superstar that he was, uh, he was performing at a restaurant, at, at, a, um, at a nightclub. And afterwards, he was having a meal. And the comedian during the meal was Don Rickles. And Sinatra didn't know him at that stage. He didn't know who he was. And Don Rickles wanted to play a joke on Sinatra, but also wanted to get in with Sinatra. So Don Rickles went up to Sinatra and said, uh, as he approached the Sinatra table, the bodyguards pushed him away and Sinatra said, let the kid through. So he came in and said, Mr. Sinatra, you don't know me, but I'm the comedian for, these, for the evening. And I'd like to ask you a big favor. There's a beautiful girl I'm with and I want to get into her knickers. I want to get into her knickers, and if you came past the table and said, hello, Don, I'd be in there like a shot because she'd think we were friends. So Sinatra said, okay, I'll do it. Let me finish my meal and I'll come up and say hello. So this is Don Rickles winding Sinatra up. So Sinatra finishes his meal, went up to the table and said, hi, Don, how are you doing? And Don Rickles looked up and said, fuck off, Frank, I'm busy. Oh, we love it. We love it. All good stuff. No, he, he had a fantastic sense of humour, didn't he? <laughs> well, both of them. I, <laughs> it's so like, did, did you ever meet Sinatra? I did. I, I saw Sinatra 18 times live in concert. And I didn't meet him, you know, socially. I just met him outside the stage door and I got to shake his hand. And I got a wonderful photograph of him and me together, which uh, is up here somewhere. Um, you have to dig it out for us next time. So when, yeah. when you meet, I mean, as you say, people are people all around the world, but when you meet your idols and Sinatra was an idol and then for obvious reasons and you've got the same steely blue eyes and all that sort of stuff, <laughs> how, how did you feel? Oh, well, I was, I was tentative because as they say, don't meet your idols because you'll often be disappointed. Uh, but I, I, I knew at the Albert Hall, so I saw him 18 times between 77 and 92. And uh, 
the in 1977 and 79 or 78, I realized that he came through a certain door at the Albert Hall, which nobody expected. So the next time he, I saw him in 1980, I stood with my sister, my sister came, and I went around this backside door at the um, Albert Hall, which is difficult, bearing in mind it's round, but there's a sort of a side entrance around there. No, I, I know, well, they, they were a client for many years. So uh, when, when I was a baby lawyer, I used to look after the Albert Hall. It's one of my favorite venues, stunning. It is, isn't it? It's gorgeous and uh, many happy memories there. So I stood in this sort of on this on this rotund bit, and suddenly I heard these cars. His car turned up. Now all the paparazzi were on the wrong side. <laughs> I stood there with my old. Do you remember the old box camera? Oh yes, absolutely. I had my old box camera, and he got out of the car, and there's about five people there, and I said, Frank. He said, Hiya, pal. Nice to see you. I said, Can I get a photograph? Sure, pal. I took the photograph. And by that time, the paparazzi had all come round to the front. And one guy, he offered me back then £200 for my photographs. And I refused to sell them. You refused to sell them? Yeah. Well, I said, uh, I, he said, give me the camera and I'll send it back to you. And I, I said, yeah, sure you will. I'll never see that again. So I kept the photographs and it was a very happy moment. And Sinatra couldn't have been sweeter. He was so nice to everybody. No, I, and uh, Absolutely. And uh, have you got those photographs to show us later? Um, they're, they're, no, because I'm, I'm not one of the people, I don't have any memorabilia anywhere in the house. There's nothing, if you came into my house, you would not know, I don't have, there's no frames, there's no awards, there's no nothing. And, and why is that? Because I treat my house like a house, not like a bloody mausoleum of photographs and awards. Do you know what? I, I know, for instance, there's magicians who nobody's ever heard of who've never won awards that are the best entertainers ever and i know magicians who've got shelf loads of awards who are the worst entertainers ever i'll tell you what paul i'll let you into a secret is that i once met somebody who was not who was not an award-winning magician yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh hang on oh what have you got Here's an award. What have you got? I have got an award. Look, I've got two awards. Hey, what are they? Now, in 1968, yeah. I won my first award ever, and that was the Neat and Tidy Handwriting at Kindergarten. Oh, that's what you want. Is that the award you got there? No. This one is from the Magic Circle. Okay. And that is the John Neville Masklin Award for uh, Literature. That was very, very sweet. I got... It's a very strange award, this, because you can't see the writing. <laughs> but you can feel it. I, I think that's rather good. And tell, tell us what, how, I mean, obviously you've got it for literature. Uh, remind us what you got it for in particular. Um, well, I... Um, <laughs> was it your whole body of work? Is that, was I, that the idea? I, I'm sure, I think so. Um, <clears throat> I literally got a phone call a couple of years ago from uh, uh, Scott Penrose saying, come to the circle on the so-and-so date. And... Uh, I thought I was going to get fired or something, you know, um, or forced resignation or, or some public school beating out the back, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I was very surprised to win it. And I presume it's just for the general body of work. So books, what I wrote. Books, what I wrote. And, and how did it make you feel? I mean, you say you're not really one for awards. How did that make you feel? Well, it was, it made me, I don't want to belittle it, and I'm not belittling it, but it was, it's, it's lovely, and it was nice to be appreciated. Um, but it was a more of a surprise, I still feel surprised, you know, because I, I'm not an award-winning magician at all. I, um, do you know, I, I've never entered competitions or anything like that because uh, of 101 reasons, you know. No, it, it, it's, and what was the other award? You, you had two in your hand. This is from... Uh, the IBM in America, the Linking Ring magazine. International uh, Brotherhood of Ma Magicians. Yes. That's right, International Brotherhood of Magicians. Their, 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 their house organ is the, the Linking Ring. And, and they have a segment in there, it's called the One Man Parade. And you can offer a one man parade of tricks, which has to be about 20 pages. And I've done two parades over the years. And um, one of them was voted the best ever in that period of time and I got a an award of excellence for it oh fantastic and what, well, so what was what was voted the best ever 
uh, well, the, the parade. Uh, so the, not the trick, it's just the whole thing. Right, okay. I will have uh, a little sample for that. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, the trick, you'll probably know some of the tricks because I do, I've done them at the club many times, um, uh, of, of which I'm very proud of doing those, you know. It's very good. And, and so what's more important for you, Paul? Is it, is it the recognition from your peers or, or from the general public? None of it. None, none of it. What's important at all? Not, no. I, 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 I'm thankfully, I'm one of these people that I don't care whether people um, like me or don't like me or appreciate me or don't appreciate me. Um, I mean, it's nice if they do, and I, and I, but it doesn't affect, it doesn't change my way of being or anything. You know, I, I, uh, I, I there's lots of Paul Gordon, my wife says there's lots of Paul Gordons. There's a Paul Gordon who entertains and writes and uh, does all this sort of stuff. And then there's the Paul Gordon who is uh, irascible, uh, um, often angry or upset or a bit narky or a bit annoyed. And then there's the Paul Gordon who stays at home sitting wine, uh, sipping wine in his log cabin. Um, so I, I, I just kind of separate everything very nicely. And um, you know, if you get a, if you get accolades, that's nice. If you don't, you know, nature is more 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 important to me. Sure. I mean, you mentioned wine a few times. It's obviously an important part of your life. What, 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 what wine do you drink? Uh, what, red wine. Ah, oh, so, quite a connoisseur then. It's good that people are discerning. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't drink. You, you know, I think uh, I was joking with a magic friend the other day that when you're a teenager back in the 70s, the only option was a uh, hock or leap from milch or... Um, Blue nun. Blue nun. That's Blue nun. <laughs> And it was dreadful stuff. And because you have a sweet tooth when you're younger, and then you, when you're in your thirties, you gravi gravitate to um, dry white wine. And then in your forties and fifties, you realize, you come to the realization that red wine is the only way. But, but, but do you have, I mean, do you have a wine cellar? Are you a bit of a wine connoisseur? Do you like a particular grape? No, I, I just, I just enjoy, a, I, I don't get, I mean, I, I have, <laughs> there's a, a legendary occasion at the magic circle where I, I i drank far too much and i wasn't well and i drank far too much but generally speaking i have one or two glasses and i just and that's it i'm very happy to sit there supping it with an old book and a bit of sinatra or jazz on the radio right but, but if, if you went to a restaurant okay and uh, you have an extensive um wine menu is there a particular bottle you would always go for um i, I mean I, not particularly. I, I like a, 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 a Shiraz or a Rioja, something of that nature. A funny for you, I was a, there was a couple of lads in the restaurant a while back and they were reading the menu like this. And they, they, you could see they didn't know what they were doing. And, they were, and one called out to the waiter, Oi, waiter, I'll, I'll have a Rioja. <laughs> no, we love it. It's all good. I mean, all good stuff. And thank you so much. Another yeah. quickie. Do you know Gordon's Wine Bar? In... Of course. It was named after you or your father. It's the family. It was the family um, wine bar. I never knew that you were connected to that to, to that wine bar. If you go in there, there's a photograph of uh, my great uncle, Uncle Lewis Gordon, and he was he was the owner of it and he founded it. Good heavens! I used to go there very often. Ah, well, that's How the family. Extraordinary. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you mentioned, as I say, you, you grew up with this amazing wealth, and you mentioned that your family lost it. How did they lose it? The way that everybody loses it, uh, overindulgence, uh, overindulgence in um, partying, uh, drinking, smoking, gambling. My dad used to gamble like unbelievable. What sort he of thing did he gamble on? He, well, my dad wrote three books on National Hunt racing and uh he he owned horses my father with josh gifford okay we we used to have horses we used to have about 18 horses my mother oh, so. i mean uh, well you'll know this racket then so, uh, so my dad i can remember about 1970 uh we were we were at sandown i think it was at sandown i was a young boy and my father put ten thousand pounds in 1970 on a horse to win and it lost and my dad went 
as if it was nothing. I mean, ten thousand pounds fifty years ago is a huge amount. It was a huge amount now, but ten thousand pounds in the seventies was a massive amount of money. So that's the kind of money that they lost, and they had this. You know, I was brought up in this massive house. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not boastful about it because I wish I wasn't. I'd, I'd rather have had um, more of a tactile relationship than this kind of partying atmosphere. You know, a lot of your people won't know these people, but um, my my dad's best mate was Felix Bonus. All oh, right, Heidi, hi. Heidi, hi. Felix, Felix is my brother's godfather. Oh, right. okay. um, so the house was full of all these people. And in particular, Harold Macmillan was a regular, by the way. Oh, was he? Yeah. And um, my father was friends with Lord Lucan. They right. used to gamble together. And also, uh, do you remember Francis de Wolfe? Of course. He was a regular. My dad was friends with him. And so there's loads of all these sort of big names in those days at the house. Well, extraordinary. I, I, I've been talking to George uh, Weiss, I don't know if you know him, Rainbow George. Oh, yes. Claims yeah. that, so Rainbow George claims that he was the last person to play backgammon with Lord Lucan. Oh, really? So he knows the secrets, does he? Uh, he knows quite a few secrets, which I, uh, you should listen. Uh, subscribe to Optimus TV. It's all here, you know. I, will. I, 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 I really will, because... Uh, um, I think you're a fantastic interviewer, Andrew. I love you dearly, and um, I wish I'd have paid more attention. Um, oh, uh, Lord Lucan, by the way, uh, I'm sure you all know about, uh, there was this awful bloke who used to come to my dad's parties, who you all know, dreadful man. Um, he owned those zoos. Um, what's his name? Aspinall. Oh, yes. You yeah. know, he was a friend That's of Lucan. Interesting character. And, and sometimes, even though people are dreadful, they've got some nice moments as well. Well, a lot of dreadful people are very charming, aren't they? Um, you know, uh, back in the 60s, my dad, with all his connections, and my dad did have connections on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, and, I, and you couldn't, my dad, my dad had offices in Portland Place in London. Yeah, it's just, uh, just around the corner from me. I'm, I'm just by Regent's Park, so it's walking oh, distance. Around the corner. I used to go there as a kid. Um, but my dad also had friends in the dodgier parts of East London. So he met people like uh, the Craze and all that lot. And uh, and I think because my dad, you know, again, my dad was very tall, very handsome, very charming. Uh, he's six foot six, very good looking, um, an ex-captain during the war, could charm the birds off the trees and and the ladies, you know. And I think a lot of people who have these kind of major flaws are charming people, aren't they? And, and it's very difficult. And were you close to your father? Not really. I mean, you know, he was a, an old, um, well, he was a public school boy. He used to go um, to Downside in um, uh, Wiltshire, wherever it is. <coughs> so and he was a very author authoritarian type father. Uh, you know, he used to get the whip and the cane and the um, spankings and all that sort of stuff. So it was it was more of a he provided for um lifestyle wise but not in emotion mm. well you mentioned uh, just a moment ago that actually you rather than all this wealth and all the trappings and so on and so forth you'd much rather have had a more tactile relationship yeah yeah oh definitely did I mean, you no, miss out was it a, was it a loveless family it was a very odd it was a very disjointed family um do you know, I, and I, I still go to counselling about this. Uh, I've been going to counselling for years and years and years. <clears throat> and I still discuss the same thing because, uh, you know, the boarding school thing, the, the partying thing, the, the people that my dad knew, the people that used to be at the house, there used to be lots of uh, fights and drink, drink related fights and arguments and all that sort of stuff going on. Uh, and in and, and, and amongst all that, I used, to, I used to hide away practicing magic because I didn't want to, I didn't want any part of the lifestyle. I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like most of the people that used to come along. And, um, you know, it was uh, a, a weird old time. And, and what, what was your saddest moment during that period? Um, <clears throat> well, so many, uh, so, so many oddly sad moments. I mean, the, sad moments would be uh, being abandoned at school at a boarding school i didn't like that at all i didn't fit in either so I, uh, it, it was uh, very difficult for 
you know, if you're a, a quiet, if you're, um, if, um, how do you, how do I can word this? If you're a compliant type child, you can, you can fit into it. But I wasn't, I was very lively and very, um, very, uh, inquisitive and the trouble is with boarding school it brings you down into this very small sort of kind of lifestyle of uh you know cricket and um latin i mean you know I, latin what's that about you know it was a weird 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 subject to force feed a kid um well, latin is the basis of all language paul i know uh, what a load of baloney <laughs> <laughs> baloney is one of them absolutely and the greek as well very good <laughs> um yeah I, I, it was just I, I don't think i really started enjoying many things until i actually finally got divorced from my first wife years after all that and then i married i met judy who's so down to earth she's a wonderful person and she really looks after me and brings out the best in me um but you know i i've not always been like I am, that people perceive me. You know, there's been some tough times and rough times, and uh, I've I've done a lot to survive over the years. Do, do you resent the fact that your father wasted all that money? No, not at all. No, I don't resent anything, and uh, I, I really don't. You know, it was it was his money, his lifestyle, his way. Um, you know, it never meant anything to me. You know, it obviously meant something to him, but it didn't mean anything to me. You know, and um. um I, I literally, uh, you know, whilst they were enjoying their lifestyle, I was doing bobber jobs to earn pennies and farthings and thruppenny bits by cleaning people's cars. So he never, ever passed any of it on, ever. But in your darkest moment, when you're looking for money and scraping around, and you suddenly realise, as you say, when things go, that's the moment you realise that I wish I'd embraced it a bit more. There must have been an element of resentment there that it, it was wasted. Well, you know, my sister, I've got two, sis, two sisters and a brother, and we've discussed this. And my, my eldest sister will call it a riches to rags story, um, which it, it kind of was, because uh, going back to when I, I left home when I was about 21 years old, and I had no money, and I, I ended up in a bedsit. So I was in bedsit land for ages without any money. And I decided to get off my ass, and I... I probably illegally, I went to America busking, doing magic and earning money in the streets and going to clubs and getting tips and uh, then doing the singing. And I was doing all sorts of things and some of them, which I probably better not talk about, just to get, get by, you know. What, 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 what sort of things shouldn't you talk about? Oh, no, I won't, I won't, I'll end up framing myself or something. So I know some good lawyers. <laughs> it was just, you know, when needs must, you, you, you go to some depths to, I don't mean stealing or anything like that, but I just mean, you know, really uh, earning money on the edge of it, as it were. What's like, the point? Oh, <laughs> I can't, honestly. It's a, it's a bit too personal as well. It's a bit, uh, yeah, I bet I can't really go there. Okay, but you, you went from that sort of side. I mean, did you love your father? Um, right, I, I felt more sorry for him, to be honest, because, you know, uh, he was obviously um, uh, part of his his upbringing. <clears throat> so his father, um, my grandfather died the year I was bo born. And so he owned all of the land that uh, Crawley Hospital is now built on uh, in Sussex. And, uh, you know, as I said, they had, they had a lot of money. And... The sad part about it is, is that my grandfather lived in this mausoleum of a mansion and he had another house, which was a mausoleum of a mansion that his children lived in because his wife, my grandmother, who committed suicide eventually, she didn't like her children. So they all lived and they were all brought up by nannies. So you can understand, I can understand why my dad was like he was because he had no love from his father. You know, and as a result, I mean, did you ever tell your father that you loved him? I did on many occasions, and he would never say I love you. He would say things like, "You know, I love you," but he could never say it. And uh, and to the day he died, I could never get any kind of. He was a he was he was cold. You know, he was a cold man. 
and, and how did that make you feel? Well, it was, it, you know, I've, I've never really kind of dwelt on that kind of thing, you know, because I just thought, well, I need to get on with my own, I need to get on with things, you know, I need to get on with what I'm going to be. And sometimes I think either children um, <coughs> become like their parents or they, they carry on their lives in spite of and try and become different. Yeah. And, and certainly, certainly that seems to be true. As you say, there was a pattern with, with your grandfather who treated his children that way and therefore your father would put you in that particular way. How has that moulded your own relationships? Oh, well, difficult because um, this, this is <laughs> very... Nobody's asked me this stuff before, Andrew, so you're very good at this. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a big problem with relationships and I'm aware of it. And... Uh, and I know in the magic fraternity, you know, I'm very good with strangers at conventions. I'm very good uh, um, performing behind the stand or performing at gigs, this, that, and the other. But I don't really have any mates in the business. You know, I'm not very good at that. And I was never very good at that at school. I wasn't a beery down the pub bloke. Um, I was never a football person. I, I, so I, I've always been a bit of a loner um, and often wished that I wasn't. Does that make sense? I oh, know it certainly makes sense. And it's very honest uh, of, of you to say that, because I think what I believe with all these conversations is we lack <coughs> this world now about honesty. And so, things, so many things are fake, not just the news, but the people and everything else. We all live a life which is actually not really us at all. And yeah. the more we can encourage people to talk about this, because it must have been, it must have been really painful not to have love at home. Yeah. Well, it was. I mean, I, it, I I can't say who because it's not my issue, but uh, there's a lot of suicide in our family and um, a lot of attempt, attempted suicides in our family. So, and, I, and on my mother's side as well. There's, so my mother's side had issues. My father's side had, had issues. Um, my, my father had, I think there were seven of them. Um, one drunk himself to death. Um, two committed suicide um one died of cancer so that you know that's that's my brother's siblings you know my my aunts and uncles so it's 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 a pretty uh, uh sad rum old bunch you know and everybody has unfinished business if your father were here today what would you like to say to him if he was here today i'd 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 like to say to him i'm i i'm sorry if i ever gave you a hard time because I now understand why you are or were like you were, um, which is, you know, it's dreadfully sad. And um, I'm sure he would rather have been different, but he, he couldn't be, you know, he was, uh, he was what he was. Um, um, you know, my, my mother on her deathbed, my mum died when I was in my twenties and she said, I didn't have four children. I had five, you know, meaning my father. Because he was, uh, I mean, a lot of my humour comes from him, I have to say, because he was uh, um, naughty. My sales side probably comes from him. My, uh, my joie de vivre. He was very much like you, Andrew. You know, he was very lively and friendly. And uh, he was always hugging and kissing people and bringing them into the fold. And, um, but my mum said he paid more attention to strangers than he did to his own family. Um, I can, I can tell you another little vignette on this. Uh, my father, because he was so big, he used to play Father Christmas in the village. And uh, children would come up and they'd go, hello, Father Christmas. And he'd go, ho, 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 hello, little one. Here's a present for you. And he'd turn around to us, his helpers, and say, go and get some more fucking presents. <laughs> It must be very difficult when you're seeing the love and the attention of making other children feel great when at home, effectively, you're being neglected. Yeah, I mean, he was not a, he was not a, you know, he was not an abusive father. He was, a, he was kind of, um, you know, we never, we, we weren't, I, I, I hope I'm not painting a bad picture because he was actually, he was a, generally speaking, he was a nice man um, and, a, and a good man, you know, he, he provided everything else. Um, <coughs> But I would have swapped all the glitter and gold and celebrity stuff that he was involved in for a nice old fashioned lifestyle of, um, you know, playing French cricket in the garden, that kind of stuff, you know. 
and, and it is, I think this is and these extraordinary times that we're going through. It's what I said beforehand, is that we, we tend to value now or, or realise the things which are more important in life than material things and so on and so forth. Genuine friendships, genuine ability to have a conversation, spend time with family. And I think it is bringing out the best in people. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I, I think also that, um, you know, just going back to the magic world, you know, when I go to the magic circle, the last thing I want to do is really doing magic uh, anymore. Uh, I used to, when I was younger, I used to in the club room, I used to do, I, I would be in the corner doing card tricks nonstop and, and loving it. And the moment I stopped doing it is when um, Chris, I got a letter from Chris Pratt saying, could you please stop doing magic in the club room because you're overtaking the club room. And, you know, I've got that letter framed somewhere. And I remember writing back to him, I said, honestly, Chris, this is supposed to be a fucking magic club. Um, and I had a big fallout with him over that. And, uh, and, I, and I thought, well, I'm not going to, that's it. So I, I now, the thing I like doing most at the club is seeing old friends. You know, I see you every now and then. And, you know, people I really like, the company of, uh, Lee Hathaway, um, pe people who know how to converse outside of magic. Because um, I recently read a, an interview. This guy said, magic is my whole life. And I, and I wrote back to him saying, and it shows, <laughs> you know, these people. Well, you, you do raise a very interesting point there, and yeah. about why people get into magic and so on and so forth. And um, uh, there's some wonderful people, some wonderful characters in, in magic circles. Some of them are outside the, the, the magic circle and the entertainment generally. But for a lot of people, magic is perhaps one of the easiest things to get involved with. Even though being magic circle, you have certain criteria for quality control, that's great. But yeah. magic, now on the internet, you can learn a trick and go out and perform a trick same day. And in yeah. a way, what's happening is you're missing, as we touched on earlier, the performance element. And I do think that magic, in a way, is compensating people for things that they may lack, the ability to communicate, the ability to engage, the ability just to talk without doing a trick. I mean, I've been speaking to you for one and a half hours now, and you haven't done one trick. And what I like about that, which is great, because we see tricks all the time, we'll come back and do some of those. But what I love about that is that your ability just to communicate shines through. Well, that, well thank you. I mean, I, you know, that's the, that's the main part about entertainment. I think if you don't like people, if you can't communicate and engage, you're in the wrong business. It's as simple as that. I, I learned that by watching people like Sinatra, uh, and in my opinion, the best entertainers, if you, I always say to young magicians, watch the best entertainers ever. Watch people like Sinatra, Tommy Cooper, Billy Connolly, Ella Fitzgerald, Victor Borger, the best opera singers. Watch the best in all the fields and you'll see they've all got something in common. And that is they walk on stage and immediately people feel at ease and they like them. That's it. It's as simple as that. And I think, um, and I, I wrote about this before in one of my books, the magic fraternity is probably one of the very few fraternities that has so many social misfits in it because it's so easy to get into. And it's, it's very easy to be bad at it. Now, can you imagine um, a club of uh, tap dancers where they have nothing but bad tap dancers? Can you imagine having a bad opera singing club? You know, where people can't sing, where they go, ah, ah, they'd be thrown out. But in the magic world, we embrace people who can't do magic. And it, it is, it, it, it's, a, it's a bewildering thing. But th there's no other club like it. There's no other, um, there's no other uh, hobby or interest like it. You, can't, you cannot be a bad piano player in a band. I mean, can you imagine? Kadonk, 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 kadonk. But it, it is extraordinary, and, and we, we, should, we have very similar views on that sort of side. I mean, but it's what, what you were saying beforehand, even about your Michael McIntyre story at the O2, oh. when, mm. when your sister was saying, not your sister, your daughter, your stepdaughter was saying, she asked the person next to her, uh, why are you laughing? They didn't know. 
in a way, that's rather like the best advice you can give to somebody about doing magic. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what magic tricks you do. What matters is the feeling that you leave in the audience that they've witnessed a fantastic night and something magical. Well, you know, uh, Harry Lorraine taught me this a long time ago. He said, uh, if you, you know, if you only look, if you only know a few card skills, a top palm, a control, a full shuffle, you can do miracles for laymen as long as you're entertaining. And I have said, do you know, what? Um, I'm very proud. Of, one moment I'm proud of um, is I was entertaining a group of magicians and laymen at a magic convention in Bedford about 20 years ago. And Paul Daniels was there. And Paul Daniels afterwards came up and said, that's one of the best performances of close-up card magic I've ever seen. And I said, can I use that as a quote? He said, if you use that as a quote, I'll sue you. <laughs> so I've never used that as a quote. but Until said, today. Until today. Well, I, let me tell you, if you look underneath that envelope there, there's a, a special writ that I have uh, Paul asked me to give to you. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a shame I could never use that, you know, but, uh, but it was nice of him to say that. But he's, he said, you know, he said so many card magicians that he's seen, and I agree with this, they could literally bore the bloody pants off you because they think it's all about them. They put their head down and they start dealing 12 hands of poker and I, I have often said, one day they're going to look up and the audience will have pissed off home. Which I think is a, a wonderful moment. I always want that when anybody puts a blindfold on. I, I say, get the whole audience out, get out quickly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's extraordinary that so many card magicians that I have seen, they think that the, the laborious, uh, non-patter demonstration of a long-winded poker routine is going to entertain anybody. Yeah. And, and, and the, other, the other thing, Paul, as well, is that when people are doing tricks, they're not engaging. What they're doing, they're all doing down here on the table and they're all looking at the card. Yeah. So you're advising people, we touched on this at the very beginning, is you're, you're advising people in this new age when you're engaging through a screen, you're trying to reach out, and yeah. you learn your lesson from maybe some of the, the great communicators, in, even in magic, somebody like David Nixon, where you mm. felt as though he was talking to you in yes. your home. That's the real skill, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. I mean, David Nixon was the big name on magic, you know, when I was watching TV in the 70s. And he looked like everybody's uncle who could do a, do a trick, didn't he? And he had that wonderful, sort of very soft-spoken, wonderful manner of, a, you know, almost like a, a, a vicar in training, wasn't it? It was sort of rather wistful voice about oh what a wonderful trick and let me show you this delightful thing um obviously chalk and cheese with paul daniels who came on later on but <coughs> these great communicators that is what they do they communicate um you know again because i'm a sinatra fan it's been said so many times in a stadium of a hundred thousand people sinatra could sing um, with bill P miller on the piano he could sing a torch song like one for my baby and 100,000 people would feel like it was being sung to them personally. So there was silence, 100,000 people silent. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, to, to... You're absolutely right, Paul. And, and a lot of the great communicators, that people say exactly that sort of stuff. And that works in politics. So um, I, I've met Bill Clinton and, and people will always say that he will control a room but when he's talking, you think he's only, only talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, you know, um, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a, one of my other hobbies is a uh, World War II history. I, I, I mean, I've got so, so many hobbies, it's unbelievable. But World War II history is one of them. And it's probably not very popular to say, but in my opinion, the best orator, manipulator, of people was, as we know, the biggest monster. Um, and if you watch his speeches, you can see people literally in a one hour speech turning from nice, wonderful, sweet, loving people into raving lunatics out of the power of speech. Oh no, but speech is incredibly powerful. And it is the great communicators. That is the skill now. 
politicians yeah. and, and we, we've noticed this a lot is that they all go for media training they all go to let's learn how to communicate even if you take take it back to margaret thatcher and they say yeah. Look, lower your voice and this is the sarchi uh, way we're going to mold you into a brand this yeah. is how you're going to be effective and you see that throughout politics you, you get tony blair with the the sultans of spin if you like they're basically working on that sort of premise how you can communicate is so key and it's rather yeah. like even though trump is a wonderfully divisive figure what happens is he is a communicator and he will make sure that he gets those column inches. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I, I'm always surprised, you know, people who I think are uh, smarter than sometimes they appear to be. Well, I've said before, now what I'm saying now is it's not a political comment, but when people say, how can a bumbling fool like Boris Johnson become prime minister, they're missing the point, aren't they? Well, absolutely, absolutely. Totally make the point. And they say, you know, and why isn't Jeremy Corbyn, uh, you know, Prime Minister? I said, take, a, take politics aside, he ain't got it. Yeah. And, and, as that. And, and it's so key. And, and this is where, I mean, you talk about performers and magicians learning the lessons, not just from other performers. And, and it's a common thread. If you ask most, Bobby Bernard used to say it, Alan Allen used to say it, Ali Bongo used to say it, all these great names in magic, which a uh, uh, general public may know as well. They'll always say, don't just look at magic and the people who do the wonderful tricks. Look at the great communicators. And you would see that sort of side where basically people who can communicate work on that basis. Boris appeals to people because he can do the bumbling stuff. But beneath that, there is that air of brilliance where he will work on the soundbite. He will work at how can I communicate to the people in a way that people understand. And he feels like everybody's buddy to take down the pub. It's rather like Nigel Farage. You know, he managed to say, this is the nation, but he's a guy who will be down there in the pub and he'll be drinking a pint, maybe one of your, your, your family's old, uh, old establishments, but he would be down in that sort of place. And you feel as though he's a guy I can talk to, who I'm gonna listen to. Yeah, I mean, it's, I th I, I'm fascinated by it. Um, you know, the psychology about how, what makes things work. Um, and my wife is too, she, she, she is very deep into psychology and she, looks at all this very deeply, deeper than I do. And uh, one of her comments was, we, we went to a magic convention as guests. And uh, there was a, a the, the gala bill had about eight magicians on it. And uh, they were all big names. One of them was Michael Piers. Now, do you remember Michael Piers? Mickey Piers, the, the, the Irish comedian as well as uh, a juggler. And I think he was a magician as well. Is that the one? That's right, yeah. Well. His name was Piers, but he, he used to call himself Michael Piers. Uh, so yeah, he was a comedian, juggler. Um, and out of pure likability, he stole the show from all these dreary, banal other performers. And as my wife said, what a lesson. All these people watching, you could learn a lot by watching why and how he stole the show. It's as simple as that. And, and, and his old gags were the old sort of um, uh, old working yeah. men's club gags, I seem to remember. But, but it's the way he delivered and yeah. the way that people liked him. He, he came yeah. on and he was likeable. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, I'm, again, I, like I said, I'm fascinated by this. And I, I had a chat with um, uh, Eric, uh, Eric Sykes once um, through, the, through the business. And Eric Sykes made a faux pas. He told me he made a faux pas by saying to... Um, Tommy Cooper, Tommy, you make it look so simple. You come on stage and they all smile and laugh. And Tommy Cooper said, yes, but it took me 20 years to learn how to do that. Yeah, it's absolutely right. And, and I think the, the other misconception that people have is that uh, you don't necessarily have to be likable. I think in entertainment, what you have to do is be interesting. Well, yeah, you've got to, be, yeah. Again, it comes to the Sinatra thing about if you're indifferent, Ensville. I mean, uh, you know, people I like in magic, the, the people I like to watch, generally speaking, are edgy ones. So I like to watch Mel Mellers, um, our president, Noel Britton. I think he's just one of the funniest. I, I love watching his, his act. Uh, um, Graham Jolly. You know, the, the people that have, there's, a, there's something about them. There's a little bit of naughtiness. There's a twinkle. Mischief, isn't it? There's a little bit of mischief about them. Yeah, and that's what Sonatinus. You know, Sinatra, apart from having a great voice, a great style and a great swagger, there was that danger because he knew people that you didn't want to know, you know, there was that danger element. So, you know, you're bringing all this to the party, aren't you? You're bringing 
um, sort of uh, control likability, a little bit of mystery, all these things and your innate talent of singing or magic make it exciting, don't they? And, and I think also, also Paul, what, what you find is that uh, sometimes it's the element of surprise. So for you, um, I, I know you're a, a fantastic magician. Um, I was surprised fairly recently to find out that you love, you're an old crooner yourself, aren't you? I am. I'm a, I, uh, I, I've been singing for since God was a boy, you know. Um, I, I, I taught myself how to sing as well. I mean, uh, again, this is not a boastful comment, but I've taught myself everything. I know I've never had a teacher. And so I, I literally, I've always, if I've ever wanted to do something, I've knuckled down, you know, I taught myself how to write. I taught myself how to perform magic and all websites and singing. So the singing came about. I always wanted to sing when I was a boy. I couldn't sing a note. So I used to practice at home. Um, hours and hours and hours a day trying to get notes right phrases this that and the other and when i was 23 i went along to a there's a famous band a, a local band back in the day uh most of the members were ex ted heath members oh yeah um and ted heath was a big name as you know in the 50s so these guys were all old pros you know they were uh, real smokers, drinkers, and they knew their business and they, 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 they all did session work, you know, big session work. And I went along for an audition, shaking like a bloody leaf, but I got it. Um, and, I, and the thing was, is I went along on this Wednesday for this audition and I got it. And he said, right, we've got a gig on Sunday. You're doing it. Oh my God. I can still remember the fear that rattle through my body. Because, you know, I'm talking about an 18 piece big band. You know, this is, this. you're out the front with a, an 18 piece swing band. And um, <coughs> that's how that started. And, and that feeling, um, magic is very, very different when you're standing there, it's just you with the audience. When you're there with a massive orchestra behind you and they're all dependent on you effectively bringing the whole thing together, how does that feel? It's it's more thrilling than magic. It's more enjoyable. I I'm I'm more in control. I, I feel. Um, I think you know, had times have been different and music tastes have been different, which I fully understand they're not. Um, I think ma ma singing would have been my thing, you know. Uh, but the kind of music I like and love is never going to make a comeback. You know, people try, but we you know we know that things are there for a period in history and. When they go, they go, and they never come back, really. Well, I'm, um, not, sure, I'm not sure that's true, though, Paul. I mean, what, what type of music are you talking about? Well, I know things come back in a nostalgic way, but the swing era... Nostalgia ain't what it used to be, you know? <laughs> Very good. Um, you know, you look at the modern music, you've got that, the 20s, Charleston. Yeah. The 30s and 40s, swing. 50s, rock and roll. 60s, the Beatles. Uh, the 70s, you then had um, uh, uh, glam rock. In the late 70s, you've then got punk rock. The 80s, you've got so on, and on it goes. Things may come back in a kind of nostalgic way, but generally speaking, when things have had their time, they've had their time. Um, so I, 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 I'm not, I, mean, I have to take issue with that on uh, because I don't think that's true. And I'll tell you why is a lot of people will go back. So Robbie Williams, for example, do a brilliant swing album. You've mm -hmm. got a uh, new generation who are introduced to the, the mu fantastic music of Queen through the movies like Bohemian Rhapsody. And then all of a sudden you've got a new generation. As yeah. you know, I'm working with uh, RJ Gibb, who's the son of Robbie. <coughs> the Bee Gees uh, and it's now public knowledge that there's going to be a movie uh, about the Bee Gees produced by the same team with Graham King and various other people who produced Bohemian Rhapsody and the Bee Gees music is the soundtrack to everybody's life and yeah. you look at the way that they've reinvented themselves I've been talking to various members of the family and various people of the bands and uh, that whole history again all here on Octopus TV do listen to those as well but you'll find that that music there are always going to be an audience. So I think you're wrong to say that that music's gone. There are people who do want to listen. Oh, no, I, I, I didn't mean it like that. What I meant was the, the, the era of, um, what I mean is the, 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 like the iconic moments, for instance, the iconic Sinatra being the, the iconic Bobby Soxer um, in the 50s, you know, the iconic rock and roll 
Elvis Presley, the iconic pop music of the Beatles. Um, so if I if I was now, I'm probably too old now, but if I, if I was now to take on my singing as a career, it would just be kind of, you know, I'd end up like a lounge singer singing uh, sort of weddings and parties. And, you know, it's, it's never really, for me personally, it would never take off outside of that. So therefore, um, I, 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 I think I, I missed the boat years ago. Well, I mean, again, you say that, and it, it is interesting, but I think that's the other thing that always gets me. People either, they'd say that age is an excuse, you're either too young or I'm too old to do this or, or whatever. How uh, old do you think the person is who's number one at the moment? I don't know. Oh, oh, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, old, How old is he? 100. 100. There you go. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Colonel, as he now is, Colonel Tom Moore, <laughs> is number one with you <coughs> alone together with Michael Ball he got number one on his 100th birthday so you know it's never too late Paul no I, I, I that, that's a kind of a novelty thing isn't it I mean it's if you if, in 10 years time if you want to listen to um uh, you'll never walk alone you, you're not going to listen to Tom old Tom's version are you you're going to pick out a, a classic version of it so it's a novel moment in time and you know I, I don't know well, you, you know, you know your music, obviously. Who, who before, before Tom, before Tom Moore, now Colonel Tom Moore, before him, who who held the record for the, being the oldest person at number one? Um, God, I, you know, I'm, I'm God, not a, God was close. That's your second guess. <laughs> well, Tom Jones was up there, wasn't he? He was uh, Tom Jones, and he was seventy nine when he got yeah. the, uh, the, the number one. And uh, he was so not—it's not unusual. And he basically phoned <laughs> up. He was so gracious that he spoke to uh, Colonel Tom Moore. Who? What, what I love about this era, uh, which brings us back to where we started. What I love about this era is that we have re rediscovered some people. We worked out the important things. The celebrities yeah. in their bathtub saying this is the great equalizer in a way have been slightly put to one side where we bring now the new heroes. It's what yeah. Banksy did when he sort of encapsulated with his latest picture. He said, oh, you've got the, look, the Superman here, you've got Batman, you've got Spider-Man, but the child is playing with, with a nurse, effectively, um, as the new superhero. Yeah. And what I love about this, it's the real people when you get to recognize that. And Colonel Tom Moore epitomizes that. Nobody yeah. had heard of him four weeks ago. Yeah. But he then personified what's so great about this country. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I absolutely. And I, I, I totally agree with you. And it's, uh, um, it is fantastic. And I think also that it, it does slightly put a uh, celebrity into perspective. And I hope it remains that way because, um, you know, for for me, I, I'm I'm not very keen on celebrity or celebrities. You know, I. Uh, there's something that's rather i always find there's something rather distasteful about people who need to have the focus on them all the time you know um so when you when somebody like that comes along like colonel tom it is it is obviously refreshing and well, nice. again just dealing with that is what we're saying about the mental health thing which people should talk about and uh, again you'll, you'll see we've done a whole series called canned laughter so canned mm. laughter is artificial laughter um, but it also basically uh, it hides a multitude of sins so we've set up a, a special thing for uh, the entertainment business but also others affected where you can talk about your experiences but the right. point about that when people say the focus on me 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 the reason for that so often is because it belies a real insecurity mm. yeah well, it does. I mean, I uh, it's and it's 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 very very sad. It's a, uh, it's like um, you know, celebrity goes along with um, dreadful facelifts, doesn't it? Or uh, or so many things people do to themselves to become acceptable or to be liked and loved. It is very sad. And uh, um, I'm sure you remember the, the the girl who kind of kicked it all off uh, in a sad way, Jade Goody. You know that kind of. She must have, yes, absolutely. Yeah, one of the first people in that kind of um, celebrity. It's like I tell you, my sister used to say this. I'm trying to think of. Do you remember Zsar Zsar Gabor? Ah, oh, yes, absolutely. She was kind of famous for being famous. Because well, she was also a great talent, and she was. And, and I always think she missed that opportunity to marry Michel Jar because she would have been Jar Jar Jar. Which <laughs> 
I thank you. I'm here all week. It's got to be good. <laughs> but you know what? What I'm trying to say is, in my in my bumbling manner, it's a bit like um, like say, Liz Taylor. People say Liz Taylor, what a fantastic actress. But actually, she was only a fantastic actress for a few years in her twenties. Because if you look at her body of work for the last thirty years of her life, most of it was pretty dreadful. So what they remember is she was actually famous for being married to Richard Burton, really. And Richard Burton was actually not a very good actor himself in later years. So people become famous sometimes for what people remember them from being years ago. So they're all, they, they do become famous for being famous. I, I think you make a good point. And, and you're right. And it's about being remembered. So to finish with, Paul Gordon, a fascinating talk. How would you like to be remembered? Uh... Well, I, I think I'd like to be remembered as a, hopefully as a, a nice person. Uh, I'd like to be remembered as a, a loving husband who did his best, level best to try and provide for family and friends. And, uh, and I think I'd like to be remembered as a guy who, who made the best fist possible of trying to make card magic entertaining and fun in a world full of some dreadfully boring card magic and you know and as well as the books you know so the books will be my legacy and they'll 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 stand or fall on future generations they'll either look at them and say that's good or they'll look at them and say that's bad but i won't be around to hear it will i paul gordon um, thank you very much indeed for being my guest it's been a real joy and two hours have flown by and we'll get you back and next time we might show some other things as well uh, but for now paul gordon many many thanks for being my guest Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, thanks ever so much for asking me. And uh, as they say, may you live to be a thousand years old and the last card trick you see is one of mine. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much, Paul Gordon. Bye-bye.